Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the top stories first. In Afghanistan, lawmakers and the Taliban have confirmed that the capital of southwestern Farah province has fallen to the Taliban. It's the seventh regional capital overrun by the Taliban in recent days as they continue to make advances amid the withdrawal of foreign forces. In Doha, U.S. envoy Zalmay Khalil Zad is set to hold meetings with Taliban leaders to press them to stop their offensive. Syria's President Bashar al-Assad has issued a decree forming a new government under Prime Minister Hussein Arnas. The country is grappling with a major economic crisis in the wake of a 10-year civil war. In Algeria, at least seven people have been killed as forest fires spread in the North African country. State Radio reported some houses were completely destroyed in at least 19 fires in 14 provinces across the country. Enormous wildfires have continued to rage across parts of Europe and the United States in recent weeks. Brazil's daily COVID-19 cases and deaths continue to drop as it reported over 12,000 new infections and over 400 fatalities. In Pakistan, 86 more people have lost their lives to the virus, while nearly 3,900 tested positive in the last 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 4.3 million lives and infected over 203 million people so far. Well, these were the top stories. News in detail after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. We'll start from Afghanistan, where lawmakers and the Taliban have confirmed that the capital of southwestern Farah province has fallen to the Taliban. It's the seventh regional capital overrun by the Taliban in recent days as they continue to make advances amid the withdrawal of foreign forces. In Doha, U.S. envoy Zalmay Khalil Zad is set to hold meetings with Taliban leaders to press them to stop their offensive. His visit comes as concerns grow over the rapidly deteriorating security situation in Afghanistan. On Monday, Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said it's up to the Afghan forces to defend their country. Now for more on this, we have with us Mohammed Ayaz Wazir, former ambassador to Afghanistan from Peshawar. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Now, if Afghan forces are superior in both military tech and in numbers, why are they losing ground to the Taliban? Well, I think Taliban are uh, uh, coming around the main cities. They have not yet taken uh, any major city except for some uh, uh, capitals or uh, provinces of the north, which uh, were defended by the American more than the Afghans. I think the Afghan forces are uh, concentrating and defending the major cities like uh, 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 Mazar Sharif, Kabul, Jalalabad, Kandahar, because uh, yeah, I'm sure you know Kandahar, uh, where the fighting is going on for the last. Uh, so many days, the Taliban wants to make an inroad into the city, but the Afghan uh, forces are defending. So the fight is for capture of one of the two, I would say, like uh, Tandahar or uh, uh, Mazar Sharif. But now that the Americans have come in with the heavy bombardment, and uh, I believe still more have to come, the use of drone and other weaponry that they have to uh, push the Taliban back or reduce their attack on uh, Shafghani's government. That is yet to come, but we have to see what happens. Right. Is this statement by the United States that it's up to the Afghan security forces to defend their country a clear indictment of the Kabul administration? 
Yeah, well, true, the Afghan forces had to defend. In fact, they were defending even when the Americans were sitting in uh, Afghanistan, the uh, front line or the first uh, line of defense were the uh, Afghan soldiers uh, fighting the Taliban. The Americans were simply giving them uh, uh, air cover. Uh, now, it is 100 percent for the Taliban that way. Uh, sorry for the Afghan uh, troops to defend their country against the Taliban with the U.S. gun. Obviously, it is for them to defend themselves. Right. Also tell us, U.S. Envoy Zalme Khalil Zad is once again on a mission to pursue the Taliban to stop the advances. What leverage does the United States have on the Taliban and what can Washington offer them? Well, the agreement between the two uh, in Doha was obviously for uh, not killing each other, but that, I think, was uh, limited uh, till the withdrawal of the American from Afghanistan. Uh, and at the same time, if we look at the deal that the American made with the Afghan government while they were making with the Taliban in Doha, the agreement made with the Afghan government was that the U.S. will provide uh, security to them. And even before that, if you recall, when Ashraf Ghani took over, the first thing uh, that he did in 2014 was to sign a defense deal with the American, which his uh, predecessor, uh, Hamid Karzai, has refused to sign. So under those uh, deals, the American are bound to defend and They have said it openly that we are uh, taking our soldiers out of Afghanistan but we are not abandoning Afghanistan. Obviously, they are, uh, they are, they are there. I mean, the, the American, as they say, are neighbor of every country. They are everywhere. They are close by. They are in the, in the sea. They are uh, in Doha and in other close by countries. They have the capability of flying their B-52s up to uh, higher than uh, 80,000 uh, altitude, where I don't think uh, any country in the region is capable of stopping them from there. So if, as they say, they start bombing from the sky, then what can anyone do? Right. Mohammad Ayaz was the former ambassador to Afghanistan. Thank you very much for talking to Indus News. Now, Washington has reiterated its commitment to continue improving the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin spoke with Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamal Javed Bajwa over the phone. In a readout of the call, Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said, Austin and Bajwa discussed the mutual goals of security and stability in the region. They discussed the ongoing situation in Afghanistan and the bilateral defense relationship more broadly. The Pentagon chief expressed his interest in building up the multiple shared interests in the region. Now, for more on this, we have with us Rustam Shah Mohammed, former ambassador to Afghanistan from Peshawar. Thank you very much for your time now. So, with the situation in Afghanistan in view, what does the Pentagon reaching out to Pakistan's military signify? But if I could um, understand your question correctly, uh, this is a moment when, uh, in a last bit, in a last ditch effort, the Americans are trying to persuade the Taliban to uh, begin serious negotiations aimed at resettlement in Afghanistan without resorting to uh, you know, war, attacks, assaults on Afghan army, Afghan installations. And for this purpose, uh, Zalmay Khalilzad has now gone into uh, Doha and he is conducting negotiations with the uh, Taliban representatives in Doha. But um, I believe the time is fast running out. And very soon, uh, these negotiations uh, perhaps would become irrelevant because we are being overtaken by events all the time. So this is uh, the last opportunity. Uh, America wants Pakistan somehow pressure or persuade the Taliban to abandon attacks and assaults on Afghan army and Afghan government installations, that is simply not going to happen. The Taliban, Pakistan have some influence, but Pakistan doesn't control their policy or their actions. Uh, 
whenever their four strategic interests are concerned, Taliban take their own decisions. And now, when they are in the middle of a battle, when in the last six days, six, uh, as many as six provincial capitals have fallen to them, why should they now agree to a negotiated settlement when the odds are heavy in their favor? So uh, I think unless the Americans pressure Ashraf Ghani rather than pressuring Pakistan or Taliban, uh, the stalemate is going to continue, the battles are going to continue, and the people who are going to suffer most are the rank and file of arms and civilians who are being displaced by hundreds of thousands every day. Uh, the Americans can pressure Ashraf Ghani to agree to make room for a transitional government. That is the only viable, practical, pragmatic solution for ending the conflict. And unless that is done, I think the, the fighting will continue. So looking forward to your comment on this. The Kabul government has been running a vicious anti-Pakistan campaign, blaming it for the failures of President Ashraf Ghani. Now, the United States has now categorically held President Ghani's uh, government and the Afghan army of being inadequate in the fight against the Taliban, despite superior technology and numbers. So tell us, how badly has this statement by the United States dented this anti-Pakistan propaganda by the Afghan government? Well, I think uh, this is uh, not unexpected. Uh, as the government becomes more vulnerable, more uh, fragile, and the Taliban's uh, string of victory continues, they would uh, find scapegoats. And one, one obvious scapegoat is Pakistan and Pakistan's alleged support to Taliban. When can they, how can they prove or document any Pakistani uh, supporters of the Taliban crossing over into Afghanistan, joining their ranks with the help of the Pakistan government. Can they prove any instance? Can they document any example of that? So I think uh, these are just uh, efforts to uh, divert uh, attention. Uh, this is not going to pay off. This is not going to work. Now the ground realities would dictate the, the, the outcome of the situation. The, the, the ground dynamics, the, the hard realities are that the Taliban are moving forward in northern Afghanistan, except for mazar -e sharif the entire northern Afghanistan is uh, under their control. And soon, they would launch very decisive battles for Kandahar, for Lashkarga, and for Herat. Upon the, upon the uh, outcome of those battles would depend uh, how Afghanistan is going to shape up in the near future, in the in the next few weeks. So the coming few weeks, in my mind, in my judgment, are going to be very critical. If the Taliban momentum is halted, even then fighting would continue throughout the country. But if the Taliban uh, momentum is unchecked and they go on to take control of more areas, I think then the inevitable is going to happen, and that is that the Taliban would have to then uh, form a multi-ethnic broad-based government that that has the support of all factions and all, and all ethnic groups. Uh, that is how the situation looks like now at this moment. Right, we're also talking about propaganda, so we cannot miss out India. And India and Afghanistan are portraying as if Islamabad's ties with Washington have totally broken down. What is your take after repeated U.S. top officials' calls to Pakistan's leadership for improving ties? Well, I think India uh, is no longer relevant in the current scheme of things. Uh, it is going to wait and see how the situation evolves and develops in Afghanistan. If the Taliban were to form a government, I'm sure the Indian government would try to work out some relationship with them, and I think the Taliban would also like to, to, to establish some, some relations with India. India is, is, a, is a big donor, uh, investor. Then India also needs uh, the Central Asian oil and gas resources uh, through Afghanistan, and India has invested billions in Chabahar port. Uh, that connects with uh, Afghanistan. So India has uh, interest, India has stakes also in a peaceful Afghanistan. Of course, with Pakistan, it's another story. But as far as Afghanistan's stability and peace uh, uh, is concerned, I think India also would be interested in protecting their investment 
and through promoting trade uh, and commerce with Central Asia through a peaceful, stable Afghanistan. Right. Now, Rustam Shah, Mohammed, former ambassador to Afghanistan from Peshawar, thank you very much for talking to Indus News. Now, Chinese envoy to Pakistan, Nong Rong, has lauded Pakistan's sincere efforts for peace and stability in the region. Meeting with Army Chief General Kamal Javed Bajwa, he said China will continue to support Pakistan as a strategic partner. According to the military's media wing, two leaders discussed matters of mutual interest and defense collaboration. It added that the progress on China-Pakistan economic corridor and the regional security were discussed in detail. Earlier, the Chinese ambassador said that the first batch of vaccines provided to COVAX by China is being shipped to Pakistan. Nong Rong added, China is committed to make vaccines a global public good and Pakistan is its priority. Now, Pakistan says India's belligerent policies driven by its extremist Hindutva ideology pose a pervasive threat to international and regional peace. In a written statement submitted to the 15-member United Nations Security Council, Ambassador Munir Akram said New Delhi has nuclearized the Indian Ocean and continues to induct advanced weapon system. He said, however, Pakistan would continue to take all necessary measures to maintain full-spectrum deterrence. Akram urged the international community to realize that a military conflict in South Asia could endanger stability in the entire region, which is key to global peace, security and trade. Meanwhile, in India, Congress Party leader Rahul Gandhi has called for the restoration of statehood for occupied Kashmir. He was addressing his party workers during a visit to the region nearly two years after Prime Minister Narendra Modi revoked its special status. Gandhi went on to say that Indian constitution is under attack by the right-wing ruling party. Earlier in his speech, Congress leader Ghulam Nabi Azad urged Gandhi to ask the government to bring a bill to restore the statehood of occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Meanwhile, in New Delhi, at least six people, including a former spokesman of the ruling BJP, were arrested over anti-Muslim slogans in a protest. The protest was organized against India's colonial-era laws, but turned into a demonstration against Muslims. Moving on, our Syria's President Bashar al-Assad has issued a decree forming a new government under Prime Minister Hussein Arnos. He was designated as Prime Minister last August to replace Imad Hamid, who was fired amid a severe economic crisis in the wake of a 10-year civil war. The government blames U.S. sanctions on Assad and his entourage for the crisis. Last month, Assad took the oath for a fourth term in office after a presidential election in May 2020. Western powers have dismissed the election as a farce. Now, Russia says the U.S. armed forces have no legal mandate to stay in Syria. The Russian embassy in Washington responded to a tweet by a spokesperson for the U.S. Operation Inherent Resolve, Wayne Marato. The embassy termed the U.S. interpretation of a U.N. Security Council resolution ridiculous. It called on the relevant U.S. authorities to review the resolution thoroughly. Earlier, Marotra tweeted, the U.S. forces are stationed in northeastern Syria under international law. Syria views U.S. military presence as an occupation as they entered the country without an invitation from the government. Now, Russia and China are holding a large-scale military exercise in north-central China involving more than 10,000 troops. In a statement, Russia's defense ministry said the Cebu Cooperation 2021 drills aim to strengthen bilateral ties. He said the drill will demonstrate the ability of both states to fight terrorism and jointly protect peace and stability in the region. Moscow sent Sukhoi Su-30SM fighter aircraft, motorized rifle units and air defense systems to the exercise. Russian media says the drill taking place until Friday marked the first time that Russian soldiers would use Chinese weapons. Now the U.S. has warned Iran that it will have to pay the price for the attack on an Israeli-operated tanker off the coast of Oman. 
The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, was addressing a meeting of the U.N. Security Council on maritime security. Blinken said that Iran's provocative behavior threatens freedom of navigation and international shipping. He urged the international community to hold Iran accountable for its actions. The top U.S. diplomat warned a failure to do so will fuel impunity and embolden others to disregard the maritime order. Also, the U.S. has slammed Iran and the Houthis for prolonging the Yemen crisis. U.S. Special Envoy to Yemen, Tim Landerking, said the militia is preventing a ceasefire through their offensive in the Marib region. Talking to reporters, Lander King accused Iran of backing the Houthis, saying it is not ready to play a constructive role. He termed the situation in Yemen dire and one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. However, he announced to provide $165 million in a new humanitarian assistance for the country. He said Washington is supporting efforts to prevent famine, which is turning out to be a real threat. More news coming up in this news bulletin after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, North Korea has warned that the United States and South Korea will face even greater security threats for going ahead with scheduled joint military drills. This comes as the U.S. and South Korea begin their preliminary military drills today. Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Jong-jong, denounced the drills as the most vivid expression of the U.S. hostile policy towards Pyongyang. In a statement, Kim said the exercise threatens the North Korean people and raises tensions in the region. She termed Washington's stock of diplomacy a hypocritical cover for aggression on the Korean peninsula. The North Korean leader noted peace should only be possible if the U.S. dismantled its military force in South Korea. She said Pyongyang will boost its absolute deterrence to counter the ever-increasing U.S. military threat. Now for more on this, we have with us James Dorsey, political analyst from Singapore. Thank you very much for your time, James. Now tell us, James, President Joe Biden had criticized Donald Trump, accusing him of warming up to dictators like Kim Jong-un. Now that Biden is in power, how big of a factor would that play in Washington's ties with North Korea? Well, I think what is, what is clear is that the uh, Biden administration has not put a major priority on resolving issues with North Korea. Uh, the Koreans may have thought that they had made some progress with the somewhat warming of recent warming of ties with South Korea, but then again, of course, uh, saw next week's preparations for major uh, military exercises and I think realize that they haven't gotten a step further one way or the other. Right, Seoul and Pyongyang recently revived the telephonic link, which appeared to have somewhat melted the ice. But actually, how far is the world from North Korean denuclearization? I don't think we're a step closer. In fact, we uh, may be even a step in the, in the other direction. So, with other words, the North Koreans clearly, one, they are economically very pressed, and their ability to raise funds uh, illicitly and, and legitimately abroad is, uh, has been significantly Im impaired in recent weeks. You've seen uh, measures in terms of uh, uh, the risk of North Koreans having contact with abroad with family members has increased which means also that the ability to get remittances into the country or uh, for smugglers has reduced significantly. You've seen uh, embassy uh, uh, drawbacks in terms of looking for cheaper premises. So the, the North Koreans are hurting economically. Mm -hmm. They need some sort of breakthrough on, on the nuclear issue. They're not getting it, and their strategy is to escalate in the hope that that's going to work, but that hasn't worked in fact. In fact, until now. Right, James, also tell us at most times South Korea has appeared rather reluctant in backing any step that might upset Pyongyang, yet Washington eventually has its way. If given a choice of not being under the US influence, do you believe that ties between North and South Korea would improve? Well, 
I, I think that basically, uh, I'm not sure that the United States is the obstacle to an improvement of relations between uh, South Korea and North Korea. I think what you're seeing is something of a difference uh, between the South Koreans and the uh, Americans when it comes to uh, the tactics one employs to try and get uh, the North Koreans to the table. Fact of the matter is that neither the American tactic nor the South Korean tactic has worked. And therefore, it really is a question of managing tensions rather than resolving issues. Right, James Dorsey, thank you very much for talking to Indus News. Well, now China has decided to recall its ambassador to Lithuania and demanded its government recall its ambassador from Beijing as well. This comes after Taiwan's establishment of a diplomatic mission in Lithuania as a separate state. Chinese Foreign Ministry said Lithuania is allowing the office to open under this name of Taiwan severely undermines China's sovereignty. It said the move disregards China's repeated warning of a potential consequences of undermining the One China policy. In Bangkok, riot police have used water cannons to disperse a group of anti-government protesters demonstrating against the handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Hundreds of police personnel were deployed onto the streets ahead of the protest. They warned that all public gatherings are illegal under COVID-19 emergency and vowed to take action against anyone taking part in protest. The protesters hurled patrol bombs at riot police after authorities detained 11 leaders of the demonstration. Last weekend, more than 8,000 protesters clashed with police. Brazil's daily COVID-19 cases and deaths continue to drop as it reported over 12,000 new infections and over 400 fatalities. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 4.3 million lives and infected over 203 million people so far. Details about the pandemic in this report. The Delta variant of coronavirus causing new highs in daily infections and deaths is prompting nations to ramp up containment measures all over again. In the U.S., the Defense Department is seeking presidential approval to make coronavirus vaccines mandatory for all members of its military. COVID-19 hospitalizations continue to surge in America's deep south states, while intensive care units near capacity in multiple locations. Meanwhile, the number of children hospitalized with COVID-19 is also rising across the country, a trend health experts attribute to the Delta variant. It is considered a fourth wave here, and uh, it's due to the Delta variant, plain and simple. The Delta variant is the most contagious variant of COVID yet known. This uh, Delta variant now comprises well over 90% of our cases in children and adolescents. In France, an extension to health pass has come into effect after the fourth weekend of massive countrywide protests. The Italian police shut down several groups on the Telegram app where users were selling fake health passes. Meanwhile, a new study has suggested that the UK is on course to hoard up to 210 million spare vaccines by the end of the year. As Australia's largest city struggles to contain its worst outbreak, harsher restrictions have stoked resentment. But people are going through a really, really, really tough time, both financially and mentally. And the only way out of this is together. Together we'll come out of this a much stronger community. Uh, as I said, uh, it's, it's, you know, mate, people waking up every morning, police helicopters. Uh, I got a call last night at midnight, uh, sorry, a message at midnight last night with someone complaining that their kids can't go to sleep because there's a helicopter on top of their house uh, flying very low. This comes as a New South Wales state reports the biggest daily rise in cases. Meanwhile, in Iran, one person is dying with COVID-19 every two minutes as the region's worst hit nation reported a record daily toll of fatalities. Meanwhile, Pakistan's COVID-19 death toll has stopped 24,000 after 86 people died over the past 24 hours. The health ministry says the virus infected over 3,800 people overnight. The ministry said the case load has crossed 1 million and 75,000 mark. It said over 967,000 people have recovered from the disease so far. The ministry added Pakistan's positivity rate has risen to nearly 
Over 37 million people have been partially vaccinated, while over 7 million have received both jabs of the inoculation. Now, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan inaugurated the ship lift and transfer system at the Karachi shipyard. Addressing the inaugural ceremony, the Prime Minister said Pakistan must end reliance on imports and attract foreign investment. He said his government has taken important steps to end money laundering. The Premier added Pakistan is on the path to achieve prosperity. He also lauded Chief of Naval Staff Amjad Niazi for taking the initiative to launch the ship lift and transfer system. Iraq's Foreign Minister Dr. Fuad Hussain will arrive in Islamabad on an official visit on the 11th of August. He will be arriving on the invitation of his Pakistani counterpart, Shah Mahmood Qureshi. The Foreign Office said to will deliberate on bilateral relations and cooperation in various fields. It added the Iraqi Foreign Minister will also call on the Pakistani leadership. The visit comes in the backdrop of a number of ministerial level visits from both sides in the past few months. Earlier, Foreign Minister Qureshi visited Iraq in May and further high-level exchanges are planned in the coming months. Now in Lebanon, at least three people have been killed as tensions over fuel scarcity descended into deadly violence involving guns, knives and hand grenades. In a statement, the army said one man was killed in the northern Dani region and two others in Tripoli in violence. Lebanon's currency has lost more than 90% of its value in less than two years, causing shortages of fuel, electricity and medicines. The crisis deepened this week, prompting long lines at petrol stations. Protests also continue across the country with political elite in deadlock over the formation of a new cabinet. Now in South Africa, a court has again postponed a long-delayed corruption trial against former President Jacob Zuma to September the 9th. He was due to appear in court in an arms deal corruption case that led to his sacking as a deputy president in 2005. Zuma was moved to a hospital on Friday for an undisclosed medical condition. The prison officials did not provide details about his condition. Former presidents jailing over a contempt of court triggered a wave of unrest in the country last month. Currently, he is facing 18 charges, including corruption and money laundering. Now, Ethiopia's Prime Minister A.B. Ahmed has urged all citizens to join the army to support the fight against Tigrayan rebels. The statement comes six weeks after the government declared a unilateral ceasefire in the northern region of Tigray. Earlier, Sudan summoned its ambassador to Ethiopia for consultations of intentions between the neighbors over the Tigray conflict. War broke out in November between federal troops and the Tigray People's Liberation Front after the rebels attacked their military bases. Fighting has spread to the adjoining Amhara and Afar regions, displacing around 170,000 people, with nearly 4 million people facing food insecurity. Now, at least eight people have died and five others are injured after a boat capsized off the coast of Beihai in South China's Guangxi, Zhuhuang region. The vessel capsized while returning from a fishing trip. Authorities said the boat was carrying more than 30 people. They said search and rescue efforts are underway. Now, smoke from raging forest fires in Siberia has reached the North Pole for the first time in recorded history. Russian authorities said the situation in the region, also known as Sakha, continues to deteriorate. More about the global wildfires in this report. From Siberia to Peru, wildfires are raging in several places worldwide, with hundreds of lives lost and thousands evacuated. Many parts in southern Europe have been reduced to aches amid region's most extreme heat wave in three decades. Blazes in two districts of Turkey's southwestern Mughla province are still not controlled after over a week. The European Union has mounted one of its largest firefighting operations ever to fight Greek and Italian fires. In Italy, the Civil Protection Authority warned of more fires as temperatures in the parts of the country reach 45 Celsius. 
Meanwhile, Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis apologized for failing in tackling the fire. This came as hundreds of protesters gathered outside parliament over the government's handling of wildfires. There is a lot of rage in the public because the government has not staffed the special. The forest fire brigade puts out fires in the forests and not the regular firefighters, but they dismantled them and this is why we are burning now. Infernos are also sweeping across Bolivia's eastern lowlands, threatening thousands of hectares of land with rich wildlife. In the U.S., firefighters continue to tackle California's Dixie Fire, which is now the second largest in state's history. Peru's Cusco is burning as well, with winds whipping up fresh flames as soon they are put out. This is now an extreme case. It is put out and then it is reactivated with the wind. We want it put out once and for all. Bring in the helicopter, put it out with water so that the fire is not reactivated again. Because later on, at around 1 to 3 p.m., the wind will start up and will reactivate the fire again. Africa is also not spared from this global scourge. In Algeria, seven people have been died and several others are injured in fires in mountainous areas east of Algiers. Now, Europe's largest active volcano in Italy, Mount Etna, puts on a spectacular display of lava during an eruption. Let's find out more in this report. Etna has been lightening up the night sky regularly with explosions. Lava fountains and ash plumes, dazzling onlookers and waking up locals with its roars. Lava flowed down the side of the 3,300-meter-high mountain. Black volcanic ash and big rocks covered streets and nearby towns after the eruption. Etna, which is located above the Sicilian town of Catania, often erupts but rarely causes damage. The camera team filming the images said eruptions continued for more than five hours. It is believed to have the longest written record of eruptions than any other volcano with his first recorded observation going back to 425 BC. Although the eruptions themselves do not put the local population at risk, residents do have to live with the ash showers. Now, Mexico's indigenous communities descended on the capital Zocalo Square to mark the International Day of the Indigenous People. According to the country's census bureau, there are some 17 million indigenous citizens in the country. Let's find about them in this report. Mexico's indigenous people were devil masked, performed the dance of the devils, showing the diversity of their culture. The folk devil dance symbolizes the escape of African slaves from Spanish masters. <laughs> The reason for this event is to make the indigenous presence in Mexico City visible, for our rights to be recognized by Mexico City government. That is the reason to make us visible. For 12 years now, we have been making ourselves visible annually in this event. Another indigenous group performed the Chinelos with a distinctive white mask and extravagant costumes. According to locals, their performance mimics the complexion and appearance of Spanish colonizers of the colonial era. It is very important for us, and especially in Mexico City, because it's losing a lot of its culture. Children don't want to speak an indigenous language because they are embarrassed. So this festival is for that, so that children don't feel embarrassed. It's culture. To preserve what we have, we have to look after it. Although Mexico has adopted the UN declarations on the rights of indigenous people, the country's indigenous people are among its most vulnerable. According to Mexico's National Council for the Evaluation of Social Development Policy, nearly 70% of the indigenous population lives in poverty. Now, with that, we come to the end of this news bulletin. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus Top News.